Chief of the World of Hip Hop and DJing on the uh, Castro Ferraris for reasons. And we've had some, you know, sort of thespians and dramatists and all the kind of stuff, but puppets we have not had. So this is going to be cool to play for sure. Yeah, very cool. I think can tell you what's going on with the station and. Yeah. Yeah. This is our this is our fourteenth couch surfer. Wow. Uh, so we're, wow. yeah, we're getting on stable footing, I guess. We're we're learning how to like book popular people. <laughs> 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 like look at the crowd, that's proof positive. Uh, thanks so much for coming by. Uh, we hope you enjoy it. There's uh, uh, someone said this is tiny desk concert meets between yeah. two ferns. You're one fern, yeah. You're, you're a stately fern. Uh, but uh, we've never tried hip hop, so I got to give a real shout out to Christian here for giving us a shot. Uh, you know, and I, I think it's gonna be awesome. We have our uh, formidable Jason D in the house. It's gonna be good to see him out of the booth for a change. I want to see how that goes out there in the open oxygen and all that stuff. <laughs> so we did just finish our fun drive. That was on Friday. We closed really strong. If you guys already donated, we really appreciate it. Uh, it was a little nip and tuck for a while. We closed really strong. If you are inspired by this, though, we always take donations, uh, $5, $20, whatever, you know, it's what keeps us going, and we can continue to have events like this, uh, which we very much believe in, and we uh, see 30, 40, 50 people, whatever, it just substantiates what we do, so we really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for coming, and uh, we'll have a halftime, but I'll let Christian do the introductions. He's basically the inventor of this thing, so... But yeah, I'm going to block for now. We'll close out a little bit. It does get pretty warm in here, but uh, the air conditioner is not very quiet, so no, you can just have that going. Yeah. But, but yeah, my name is Christian Wynn. I work with Wayne and the station to put together like once a month, um, September through February, the, the Couch Surfer Artist mm -hmm. Series, where we do bring together. Yeah, musical artists and literary artists and um, just get a performance and conversation so it's gonna be about half performance half conversation um, half whatever we choose it to be so it's always kind of a really cool organic experience just being in this tight little kind of space so um, this is Chad tell me how to pronounce for sure your last name uh, Shohat that's what basically I was gonna say Shohat <laughs> okay so who's going to be introduced a little bit further in a minute, but I'm going to let these two guys kind of kick us off. And I'll give, uh, give you their credentials here. So some of you know them, obviously. Yep, it's, it's been a privilege and a pleasure to get to know them and see them play yesterday down at the block party outside uh, Boise Brewing, right? Yeah. That was pretty sweet. So anyway, Eleven and Jason D. Um, are Boise-based hip-hop artists who grew up in the, on 80s and 90s golden era hip-hop which we'll talk about a bit tonight. So, um, Eleven relocated from San Diego more than a decade ago and prides himself on being a husband, father, teacher, basketball coach, and MC. In addition to production duties for the pair, Jason D. has spent the last 30 years on college and community radio. He hosts the underground hip-hop show, The Wreck, on Radio Boise, and is featured... The Wreck! The Wreck! <laughs> <laughs> And is a featured <laughs> DJ on the Wednesday Wreck. Q, no, no Wreck this time. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no problem. Q, oh, um, <laughs> uh, KHDC -H in Salinas, California. E and J are currently finishing their third studio album, Strike Back. They pride themselves on making authentic boom bap hip hop for those who've grown tired of what mainstream outlets are pushing as hip hop. So, without further ado, Take it away. Yeah, so we, um, we're going to, kind of the, the format is we'll do a couple songs and we'll talk about it ahead of time. We'll answer questions <laughs> afterwards. To me, there's no bad questions, right? And so if anybody's curious about anything we say or do, we'd love to know what that is. And uh, ahead of this, we were talking about how we have different uh, formulas or different styles of songs that we do. And we're going to kind of set it off with, they're almost like introductory songs or return songs. Is that how you would describe it? Yeah, I, I think every hip hop artist <laughs> makes an album, and they have a song on it. It's like we're back. Like we, you thought we went away, but we're actually back, and now we're we're even better than we were last time. You know, there's sort of this very exuberance to to like be kind of in your face. And so these first two songs are really 
uh, braggadocio and, and in nature, That's what I was say. and and really about E and J is the best, you know, and and, and we're back. Yeah. Well, we, well, hip hop is, a, I mean, in my opinion, you know, hip hop was a form of um, pretty much expression, you know, or it is a form of expression, and that expression usually is about yourself, you know, and how good you are, you know, or how good you want to be, and because it, at one point it was, you know, a, a claim to make a name for yourself. So if you weren't better than the next guy, then you were nobody. So, you know, I mean, we try, in my opinion, to get that golden era of hip hop where we try to explain how good we are, you know, and, and for me, I feel like um, I, when I wrote these two songs, I had a period of, uh, I guess a hiatus. I remember you and you and Travis said that on the on the uh, rec show one. So yeah, eleven live. You had a hiatus. I think I saved that. I wanted to use that as a sound. <laughs> um, but uh, so these songs were, were for me were like that. I'm back, and and I want to gain my respect again, kind of a thing. So they're very braggadocious. And, you want to say so? All right. So we're gonna try this without the mics. We're we're pretty loud, but if you guys think we need the mic, let us know. We do have it right here. And actually, he's probably so used to holding the mic, he'd probably rather. Yeah. Rather hold the mic anyway. We'll so, see. and we'll play with volumes here too. Just hold the mic and turn it off. Just come <laughs> <laughs> Can you guys hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? More music or yeah? Okay. Oh. 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 O
keep that mindset in my section. Real proof, less is more of an impression. Not just touching the surface, I love impressions. Collections of words, balance of art. Listeners know the expectation from the start. Practitioner from shooting after being set apart. Never set your mind, I set your mind and your heart. Come on. You know, I'm almost well, like all the stuff he's, all the stuff that you said about me, you can say about. Well, take the basketball out and put soccer in, right? Yeah. So I mean, like, all the you, other stuff. And tell us what you, I don't know. What are you? What, who are you as uh, hip hop artists and you know, sort of DJs in this community? So. Yeah. So you know, when I was in junior high, uh, living in the Bay Area, California, breakdancing hit in my junior high. We were all trying to do that. I was not a fantastic uh, break dancer. In fact, there was the dance battle yesterday, and I was like, ooh. Uh, <laughs> but I got into uh, being the guy that had the boombox that played the, the mixes. So the evolution of that was being interested in, in DJing. And uh, by the time I got to high school, there was probably a dozen DJs at my high school. It was, it was actually a, a respectable hobby. And this one friend of mine in particular, his dad had a really long workbench, and so they had three sets of these set up, so three sets of turntables. And, you know, no YouTube guys, no instructional videos, just a bunch of guys <laughs> in a garage, and it sounded really, you know, it was, it was like, you know, really bad. You know, it was like a lot of grinding around, trying to, to find our style. And so, to me, it was just something I did. It wasn't, you know, I think people today say, oh, I'm gonna be a rapper because there's some career in it or there's some 
thing. It was just a hobby. It was just kind of what it was just kind of what we did. And um, so I learned to DJ in high school. So when I got to uh, the university, they had a radio station, and I'm like, ooh, how do I? get to DJ on, on uh, the radio station is at UC Santa Cruz. I took a broadcasting class and then started started right away. And I've been doing college or community radio ever ever since, so. Yeah, very similar, except I was in elementary school, so that makes Jason a little older Sorry. than me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a little older. <laughs> yeah, I did. Elder statesman. <laughs> a little more wiser than me. Um, yeah, so I was in elementary school when, when that all hit. Um, I remember, uh, like it was yesterday, my, my older brother, I have an older brother, he's two years older than me, uh, our next door neighbor was his best friend, and he would come over with the boom box. I mean, this huge radio, I mean, probably weighed 45 pounds, and, and he, he came to our front door and blasted fat boys through the through the screen, you know, and, and, um, and it was stick them, you know, you hear this, stick them, you know, and I was like, what is that, you know, and, and, and so that's what turned me on to hip hop at first and the breaking scene and stuff, and I, I tried to break dance, I used to, I loved to dance, I was in a dance group and, and probably in junior high through somewhat high school, and I actually grew up thinking I was going to be a singer, I listened to, I mean, if you guys follow me on Instagram, I've been posting my top albums, but like, Keith Sweat and you know I mean any I mean New Edition all these groups that R&B artists and I sang at the top of my lungs and then I hit 13 and my voice cracked and next thing you know I couldn't sing anymore so I was like well I'm gonna be a rapper uh, so <laughs> so I but I always I always like to write um, I, I read a lot all the time I mean I'm a I taught English for 20 last 20 years I'm mean, an English teacher and I think that was one of my biggest passions so you know I secretly wrote poetry and stuff and. And so I said, you know, I'll, I'll try this rap thing, and I was horrible for a long time. And I mean, not that I'm, I don't know, you guys can tell me if I'm good, I don't like to talk about <laughs> myself, but, um, but you know, and it took a while, and there were a lot of people on my block and neighborhood who, who you know, rapped, and we'd have these ciphers, and I'd try to go in, and always was booed out, and, <laughs> you know, and did talent shows, and was booed off stage, you know, so, and, but my friends that I was rapping with, they were really good and they would always tell me to keep going and if I liked doing it, to keep riding and keep pushing myself. And, and so they kind of gave me the courage to keep at it and, um, and, and we did for a long time. And then I went off to college to play ball and, and then kind of came back to it once I became a teacher, just being around it again and riding. And, and then there's younger kids that reminded me of myself and they were trying to start rap groups and do talent shows and asked for my help. and. And so I helped him the next you know, I started writing again and got back into it and moved to Boise and it's kind of history from there. But to, to tie it back to your question though, you know, I think some of the fundamentals of the early days of hip hop was uh, the number one rule was no biting, it yeah. meant no copying anybody. And so what you were really out for was respect yeah. and you wanted to be respected for your kind of individual style. And so we pay very little regard to what is considered popular or what yeah. is considered, you know, um, uh, yeah, I don't know, I call it consumer grade, you know, hip hop. It's people that are out for sales, right? And and we kind of do things that we think, um, we feel like we're competitive, we push each other, and we're competitive with the other, uh, everybody in here that's a hip hop, or we all look at each other like, yeah, you're, that, you're almost okay. Yeah. <laughs> we're competitive. No, but all jokes aside, I think, you know, it's just that spirit of, of just earning your respect that kind of mm -hmm. keeps us grounded in, in kind of that original sort of like early 80s, 90s style. Yeah. Yeah, well, we'll get into that a little more later, but. Just quickly, like, what? How, how did you guys do? Like, you two guys hook up, like, to put this duo, you know, this group together. Go for it. Well, J Jason like woke up one day and realized he couldn't live without me. <laughs> 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 there's, there's three sides. To might have been, story. might be the other way around, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And, uh, you know. No, I, I think I, I, I don't, I can't remember actually how we first met. But I remember doing a show after I hadn't done any music in a while over at, what was it called, the Red Room yeah. or something? Yeah. And I remember you and Trav being in the audience of the Red Room and, and, and I was super nervous. I think I messed up a lot. <laughs> and, and then I think you called me a little bit after that or something and asked me if I wanted to do a song, which I was like, yeah, yeah I would love to. And, and we'll do that song later, I believe. Okay. Just rock the spot. Yeah. But, um, yeah. And, you know, it's kind of history from there. Like, I feel like... Jay is one of my closest friends now, and just because... So it's been about how many years? Oh, um, man, good five, six years, right? Yeah, yeah my closest seven. Seven, seven yeah. yeah, yeah, it's been some time. Yeah, I, so he, uh, uh, Eleven had put albums out with another uh, 
famous local producer named Noah Hyde. I don't think anyone knows Noah. DJ Noah Hyde. And uh, Noah started pursuing some other musical stuff and kind of left you without a DJ and without well, a producer. I'll tell you. Well, I started having babies is what really happened. Yeah. You know I, mean? like, I, have, I have five kids and there was just no time. Noah doesn't. Noah had an older daughter who's, I mean, she's in her mid-20s now. So it was more like our our schedule changed where we used to be able to hang out all the time and do music together. So it's kind of like fate in a sense where I was moving along with my wife and kids and he moved along to actually do what he really wanted to do because no one knew he could do hip hop stuff. But then that's how, you know, I came. came so I was actually playing his music on my radio show. Yeah. And then oh, okay. and then I kind of sought him out at a yeah. show. And actually my, my first uh, beat that I made, I gave to Dave the Fave there, dedicated servers. And so they have the finest remix. <laughs> and Eleven was on that remix. Oh, yeah. That's right. and I so, thought that was that. And so I think that kind of, yeah, that kind of helped that connection. It's a good song. It's pretty nice. Yeah, I know. You go, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, when I moved here, you know, one of my heartaches was giving up my radio show back home, and I figured out through file sharing and whatnot that I could send a mix back home, and the DJ, the, the, the host would pretend I was still, you know, DJing there, even though I wasn't there. Uh, but I was down at a live at five, which is something, you know, you move here and you're trying to figure out what's going on, you go down at a live at five, and uh, Jeff Abrams, the former Radio Boise station manager, had literally put up one of those signs that has the thing where you tear off the phone number, and it just said, want to start a radio station, and I was like, yeah, because I was missing, you know, my, my uh, community radio station. And I started volunteering. I, I think I volunteered for like four or five years before we even were online or something. So I, I remember Wendy at those early, Wendy Fox is in the front row. <laughs> at those early meetings, staring at whiteboards, going, oh my God, this is never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and here we are. So it's cool. All right, well, let's shift it over to Chad. Yeah. And we are sadly missing um, Jamie, Jamie Nebikern, who is ill at home, who is the homegrown theater's managing director. and. Um, we're missing you, Jamie. But um, you can do your best to yeah. with the Jamie. And, and, Chad, <laughs> and Chad, we have a mic for you if you want a mic. I don't know. How do you feel about I'm, that? I'm fine. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So I'll, I'll, I'll do a brief just intro, just but then we'll get into a bit of performance from you. First sure. off, and then we'll talk about some collaboration, even though the puppet will be your collaborator tonight. And yeah, yeah, sure. You know, you, you know Jamie very well, and so you can like speak to all your uh, interactions as far as putting together. The, the kind of art you do, but uh, um, Chad Ethan Show It um, is an explorer of poking the theatrical bear, which I would like to talk about as well. Um, primarily a director, writer, actor, and puppeteer, but never in that order. He likes to explore the chasm of the unknown, unexplainable cosmic anxieties that creep around the subconscious. Mostly, he is a dreamer who has terrible nightmares. <laughs> It's a lot of accomplishments, like, it's, it's a longer bio, but it's like, yeah, it's done a lot of great stuff, but I mean, yes. Um, would you like to give us a bit of a performance to start us out? Uh, sure, yeah, so uh, the, the, the piece that uh, Jamie and I were going to do uh, was, was a piece that we originated with six puppeteers that last night we were able to whittle down to two puppeteers. Uh, she's unfortunately sick, and I don't think I have enough hands to do <laughs> that piece. So uh, in, instead, um, if I, I've got a script uh, that, I, that I could read for you. Um, something that's kind of unique to how homegrown theater uh, and, and kind of our process of, of puppet building um, that, that's actually Un unknown to us, uh, we learned that this. Uh, we were surprised to learn that puppet theater doesn't start from a script. Uh, puppet theater traditionally starts with puppet, and somebody builds a puppet and then comes up with the with the character with, with an idea or something surrounding that. Um, but but the process uh, at the horrific puppet affair anyway has been um, to work with playwrights and to start with a script. Um, I, I I've done a little bit of work at the. National Puppetry Conference, and and I, I had a conversation with their old artistic director this last summer, and I was telling him that that's our process. We start with playwrights, and he hadn't heard of that. Um, so I'm going to read a script for you really quickly, which is um, a, a piece that that we originated uh, several years ago, 
uh, for the third horrific puppet affair. And uh, although it's it's very rare, it's never happened before in the horrific puppet affairs history that we repeat pieces. Uh, it fit well within the themes that we're exploring this for this year's puppet affair. So we decided to uh, resurrect it. So this script is called Beyond the Farm. Socks. A horse wakes up. He wears a horse blanket covering his body. He neighs out to his family. Where is the child? No one replies. Socks exits the stable to look for them. Where are they? He neighs again, circling the farm. No one replies. Socks bucks and screams. No one replies. He hears a sound beyond the farm. Is it the child? He backs up and starts a run. He's never left the farm before. Will he jump it? Socks takes a deep breath and jumps. As he clears the fence, his horse blanket snags the tallest post, ripping it off, revealing Socks, a skeleton of a horse, lands in the clearing. Where should he look first? Right? Left? A brand new world before him. He begins to run. He runs. He runs. He runs through all the colors of the world. He grows exhausted. He cannot go on. He collapses, but he cannot give up. He must find the child. A cluster of butterflies lands on his nose. Something is different. Sox sees something strange in the butterflies. He whinnies and they scurry away. A skeleton of an armadillo waddles by. Sox whinnies again. The skeleton of an anglerfish swims by. Sox is stunned. Finally, the skeleton of a lemur, the harbinger, floats by. The harbinger tries to guide Sox into the mouth of a cave, but Sox refuses, afraid by the horrible sounds coming from it. The harbinger guides Sox to a river where Sox sees his reflection. Sox kicks at the water and runs away. He runs as far as he can. The harbinger tries to keep up, but he cannot. Socks is alone. Socks runs through the colors of the world. Socks runs past all the details of all the things. Socks runs away from memory or familiarity or reason. Socks runs. Socks runs into nothing. There is nothing around Socks. No trees, no farms, no skeletons, no harbingers, no nothing, no child. He neighs to her. Nothing. Where are they? He neighs again, circling the nothing. No one replies. Socks bucks and screams. He really screams. Fear, loss, lonely. He hears a sound beyond the nothing. Is it the, the child? He approaches the sound. And beyond the blurred veil is a fuzzy image of a tiny girl. The child, wearing riding breeches and boots sits on a bale of hay, hugs the body of something lying very still. What is she hugging? Socks neighs to her. Nothing. What is she hugging? Socks tries to approach, but the closer she, but the closer he gets, the blurrier she becomes. What is she hugging? Socks screams. The child seems to look up for a moment. A mother comes in and takes the child away. Socks sees his body. Sox turns and walks away, away from the nothing, away to the clearing where the harbinger waits for him. Sox enters the cave. End of play. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's uh, we we start with uh, kind of stage directions or pieces of text, and uh, and then we devise and build our puppets around around that. So. I'm curious, uh, who wrote that piece? Uh, Jamie and I created that piece. I wrote the text for it, okay. um, but that's something that we devised together. And what's the process like from there? I mean, because you have the puppets, mm -hmm. um, and who's been to the Rogue Puppet Affair? A few people here. It's, it's pretty crazy cool, and it's happening very yeah. soon, by the way. Yeah. Which is, it, tickets uh, are available. Tickets <laughs> are available. We, we preview uh, Thursday, we open Friday. 
and then we run uh, Tuesdays through Saturdays up through November 2nd with uh, 8 o'clock and then uh, we do two shows on uh, Saturdays so there's like I think that adds up to like 16 performances uh, at the Gem Center for the arts so cool. yeah come visit us yeah and so maybe if you give like a thumbnail description of yeah. what it actually looks like I mean it's difficult verbally you it's, know to like yeah. describe the puppets <laughs> and they yeah. do in the show itself but maybe just like I don't know how to, what does that one look like in particular? The, that piece in particular? Yeah. Uh, so for that piece, we uh, have built a uh, a nine foot uh, a nine foot long Bonraku horse puppet, uh, which requires three puppeteers. It's it's full scale. Um, I mean, it's like a small horse scale, uh, but uh, yeah, it fully articulates the way a horse might. Um, uh, Jamie and Jessica have spent a lot of their lives uh, around horses, so uh, they've got a lot of experience. We, we do a lot of research making sure the thing moves in a way that is uh, is believable. believable so and, the um, two people in the horse costume, like back from Yeah, the, it's, it's, it's a, yeah, essentially, like, <laughs> yeah. Maybe a little yeah. bit more perfect, like, yeah. artistic than that. Well, so. <laughs> That's actually a good idea. We're gonna do that next time. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, but from there, and then you have a stage set mm -hmm. for a little bit. Um, yeah, and it's creepy. I mean, your puppets are cute and creepy yeah. at the same time. What? I don't know who who builds the puppets. Uh, so our our production staff primarily, uh, or, or we, we hire puppeteers. Uh, and, and we, we think it's valuable for puppeteers, the performers, to also help in the building process. Uh, Jamie, Jessica, and myself, and Leah do the majority of the, of the building. Um, but we think it's important that, you know, if, if, an, if an actor receives a prop, you know, they, they might hold it like a prop, you know, or, or, or whatever. Uh, but a puppet doesn't necessarily have that same relationship with the performer. Uh, the, the performer always finds uh, much more, I, I've witnessed anyway, that when a performer has a hands-on, uh, you know, hands-on in the creation of the character, that the character comes alive in ways that are really uh, unexpected. Yeah, and you you know at homegrown theater you don't just do this work in public affair at one of the you know sort of uh, I guess I guess it's one type of drama you present mm -hmm. through you know yeah. through one type of theater you present but um, I don't know maybe speak to like homegrown theaters like baseline message or what they're all about they've been around for eight mm -hmm. plus years now and. Um, also, would love to hear again the or origin story of the puppets that happened. That. <laughs> I think the Red Room, or yeah. one iteration of the Red Room, happened yeah. there. Like uh, the, the birth of this particular our form. our kind of creative uh, a, a huge creative like eye opening experience for us was uh, the the first horrific puppet affair, uh, which was uh, happened at the Red Room. Um, and we were we were hired by the booking manager at the time to come up with a horror puppet show that would be the opening act for like the 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 death metal weekend. Uh, <laughs> and so we, we thought <laughs> we're like okay, uh, we'll try that. And so you know we, we we created something that we felt like was um, really exciting and. and you know, not something that we got to do anywhere else. But, uh, but we were also really nervous. I remember showing up to the Red Room, and and the that the Red Room at the time was like always this perfect uh, <laughs> this perfect blend of like uh, bikers and true goth kids and some homeless people and like <laughs> it was it was just I loved that bar truly. Uh, but we showed up with our puppets. And we were going to perform before the heavy metal, which is something that we could tell everyone in the room was very excited for. <laughs> <laughs> and we were the thing right before that. Uh, and, and we started our, our piece, and I'll, I'll never forget the experience of, of just, first of all, walking on stage expecting to be just booed off of it. And, and for nobody in the room, nobody in the room was at the stage. Everybody was playing pool or at the bar or 
chatting and that's fair like we're in their bar you know like and and uh and nobody was paying any attention to us and i remember uh that play was uh with dakota and jamie and i and and there was like three four minutes before jamie entered was just dakota and i and i just remember working so hard for anyone's attention and and he and i were just like we're, we're just paying attention to each other and 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 i you know i think as eight years ago, it was probably peaked performance um, <laughs> and downhill sense. Um, but, uh, but slowly, you know, people moved over to the seats that we had laid out. And by 10 minutes, everybody in the bar was watching us. And, and not only that, but uh, the, the play was about this puppet who, who wakes up and discovers that he's a puppet. And um, he has to meet the end of the play, which is the blackout at the end of the play. He dies. He, he learns throughout the play that this was all part of the thing. And, uh, and, and I, I, as the puppeteer, would kind of help him through this journey and comfort him. Uh, so, so towards the end of the play, he had to, he had to meet his demise, his blackout. And, and the experience of people who had not cared about us throughout the beginning of the play, like, calling to us and saying, no, it's okay, and treating the puppet with That's empathy so cool. uh, was like, was wild. And, and it really taught us that like, okay, this is actually the kind of theater that we're supposed to be doing. And, uh, and so yeah, that's kind of, that's our oriented story, that, I guess. Yeah, that sounds great. Mm -hmm. oh, very much so. Mm -hmm. uh, just that notion of empathy and sort of mm -hmm. understanding of a character and like starting there, and letting that organically sort of seep into sort of what the, the puppet delivered and you delivered through them, I guess, that's pretty amazing. At a death metal show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, you were sort of you were doing some poking there. So what the yeah. poking, of, <laughs> <laughs> poking of the bear, like the theatrical part, you know, sort of the, in, I don't know, I mean, I guess what does that mean to you? I don't want to put words in So yeah. That's a little bit of, um, uh, there's, <laughs> we, we kind of have a philosophy where we're like, is this a play? Um, is it, we have ideas that we're really interested in, and we can see it a little bit, and we have, you know, oftentimes we find ingredients to what might be a performance, and uh, we like to throw spaghetti against the wall. I like to throw, you know, ideas. Um, th those I ideas that, were, that you truly like, I don't know, <laughs> tend to be really rewarding and, and also controversial. Um, we, we had this piece last year uh, that it was it was this little monkey floating through space singing this song, this love song to the moon. But the moon can't see him because he's a monkey, he's too small. And the moon doesn't care because she orbits around the earth and she sings a song to the earth. And, and they all orbit around and the earth sings to the sun and all these plants come out at the end and it's this coral number and it uh, was something I believed in so thoroughly and it, it was, it flopped. Um, <laughs> um, people were like, um, I thought this was a puppet show. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know, things like that. I'm, I'm happy to be a, a producer of, of ideas that we don't know what the result might be. Because uh, also at the end of the day, you know, 95% uh, of the, the audience you know, kind of turn, tuned out during that five minutes of the puppet affair, and and a handful of people come up to us and express that that one thing uh, resonated to them and was special to them. So, that's cool. and that's yeah. like yeah, the higher art perhaps of the you know the whole operation, <laughs> the idea, yeah. yeah. Um, and maybe you guys can relate to that sort of uh, notion of like maybe sort of poking the bear of like the industry or kind of just like you know you kind of alluded to that earlier. Yeah, that's, actually, that's okay. actually a great segue. When, when it comes to our creative process, it always works where I make the music first, and then I send I send it to him. And um, I even go so far sometimes as to like come up with hooks and say, okay, here's the hook. And, and he's always like, no. <laughs> I have to say on the new album, we just finished the song where I did the hook, but I recorded it before I sent it to him, so it's my voice. And he's like, oh, I actually kind of like that. <laughs> so I, I, I finally arrived. But um, the next two songs we're going to do um, are kind of pushing the envelope for us. Um, you know, I guess the, the, the thing I'll say about the first one, and I'll let you talk about it, is so, you know, I don't know when I send him music um, how he's ultimately going to arrange it, right? He could write three verses, he could write two, he could write whatever. And so typically what he's getting from me is an instrumental that has maybe like eight bars of one pattern, eight bars of another pattern, and then it just kind of repeats. So I remember this was one of the, this is a, a beat that I actually um, 
sample, and I actually, I think Axiom told me he heard, heard the original in the bar, and he was like, ah, oh, I, I can't remember if it was this one or not, but this was a beat I really had to slow, slow down from the original form to get the sound that I wanted, <coughs> so it's a little bit disguised that way, but he said, oh, I loved it, I wrote to it. And I was like, oh, well, I need to arrange it. How many verses, you know, he goes, no, I wrote the whole way through. So I sent him like a three minute instrumental and he just goes from, from day one all the way through. And uh, I, I want you to talk a little bit more and then I'll tell you my reaction when I first heard it. So. Were we supposed to start going? I didn't know if that was. Why do you know? This is kind of like, why am I saying my pants? No, no, uh, I didn't know if you were gonna go back to Chad. Yeah, I'll go back to Chad maybe, um, actually, you're, you're ready, you're all queued up. Go for it, and then we'll, and we'll just, because Jamie's on here, it's a little bit different format than we originally planned, but it's totally fun. I think you should go into the discussion of the song and how you guys work and then perform, and we'll go to halftime. Um, that. I've, let's, let's just do the song, and then, because um, some of you know it, you'll know it when you hear it, but I'd rather go do the song then talk about it, or because you might have Why some questions about, about it. In the second half, then we'll, yeah, close this out first half with the song. Okay, and then we'll yeah. And then if they want to ask questions about it or whatever, we're going to do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start it with the intro and then drop it right when you come in. Okay. Okay. And then uh, <laughs> might ask for a little audience help here. Uh, <laughs> all right, so uh, any Breaking Bad fans out here? <laughs> Who the hell are you? You know, you all know exactly who I am. <clears throat> now, say my name. I'm Michael Brown, Trayvon, and Emmett Till. I am a splitting image of souls saved and killed. I am, through my father, a soldier at war. I've been at sea. I've seen bloodshed on sand for land, and I am home security. Yet, I am the nemesis, bullying gamers, trying to become a Sega Genesis. Musical origin, data back to back, trackers, the 93 tracker, bumping the latest rapper on poverty and greed. I'll be the moment you leave, and then while you return, I am the lesson you learn. That record, eight tracks, take depth. Okay, player, that B-boy, Bomber DJ, and Ron Sayer, I'm Harriet Rosa and Seeley. I had to let these MCs be me to know they can't defeat me. I am, through my mother, a beacon, a presence of strength that asks me to get on time at 59. I am quick with every color, even my sister and brother. No wonder I am a lover. I'm the twerk, the bop, we bop, and the player. I am you. You, her, and him over there. I'm the past and the present, making lanes for the future. Paperboy, the body digital, Chris to Luna. I'm experience, opportunity, I'm your vision. A movement, improvement, action, and diction. I am violence, I am peace. I am silent, a volume increase the corruption, conspiracy theory, press release, am I an airplane, a bomb, I am bomb, believe, I can't breathe, police thieves as jokers, I'm protection, proceeding to provoke ya, I am greatness, I'm his creation, a miracle of rebirth after devastation, I'm that balcony that held all of your leaders, I've seen ignorance assassinate our teachers, I'm the takeover, I am that ether, I'm the beat that brings the best out of the speakers, I'm that plague, that epidemic that causes mass hysteria. I'm a tsunami in your area. I'm cross colors, medallions, and pride. Black on black, I'm gang related and genocide. I'm the people, equal, gender, race, or evil. Good, healthy, wealthy, strong, poor, or feeble. I'm your conscious, pushing words of wisdom. I'm a critic, and sometimes a victim. Love it or hate it, I'm the double edged sword. I'm the resort that trouble you cause when you were born. The emotion you feel when you're born from a scuffle. When you're muffled or kneel into your board, I'm the encyclopedia to Wikipedia to what they feed in you through social media. Look, I'm the N word muted because I know I'm better. I'm changed, I'm strange, and I'm terror. I'm awkward but likable at the same time. I'm the top, side, middle, and the bottom line. Check it. I am a brother's ways, they're for my brother's keeper. I see my sister struggle, never judge a fight with evil. I'm shelters, black chucks, and 23s, moving like the Nike swoops, progress and victory. I'm Miles Davis, I am ageless, a sample instrumental with over duration. I'm what you think and what you see. Who you really are, who you want to be, and who you want to meet. I'm inspiration over grief, y'all. I am hip hop, more than just a voice over a beat. Yeah! <laughs> Do you want to talk about it or you want to go to the break? What do you want to do? Let's take a look at the time. We got time to talk about it. Let's talk about it. Yeah. So let's hear what
the process. The, I don't know. We'll just, yeah. um, you guys know what you're talking about, <laughs> but uh, I'm curious, definitely, like, I don't know, politically, socially, sort of, like, obviously, it brings a lot to the table. So, yeah, you know, yeah. that, but I guess maybe the um, structure of the song kind of all come together. Well, it's definitely why, I mean, Jason said it simply, I mean, I was trying to look for something. Right when I heard the beat, I, it was kind of like, a, I'm one of those people I get a beat and I ride around to it sometimes longer than Jason would like me to. But um, I, I like to feel, I like for the beat to pull something out of me rather than me to pre-write and then try to fit it to the beat. And with this one, it felt emotional. So I was trying to connect who I was as a person at first and what made me and how I came to be an MC and all this stuff. So, you know, the drops of my, my father in there, my mom, my brother and sister, and you know, the area I grew up in, all those little things. And then I started pulling all this stuff. It's probably, I maybe rewrote it maybe a hundred times, who knows, wow. you know, because I, I said it to Jason a few different times. I was like, all right, I don't, I'm gonna go back to the drawing board. But I, I found myself pulling all these things out of, um, not only just who I was, but probably who every MC is, who every rapper is, and what hip hop is about. Because um, hip hop is political, hip hop is from the street, hip hop is sometimes, you know, um, accepted by many people, sometimes not accepted by anyone. Hip hop tells stories of, of our history, hip hop, uh, you know, tries to shine light on certain things. And, and so I found that I was not just trying to shine a light on who I was, but kind of what hip hop is. And um, so, you know, when I get into the the, the clothing of uh, the Nike swoosh and the Adidas and the shelter, you know, all that is generation from Run DMC and, you know, and, and, and people, you know, buying jewelry or whatever the case may be. And, and, and so ending it with, uh, I'm hip hop more than just a voice over a beat. Like nowadays, I think music is more about the beat and how the beat sounds, you know, the beats are the same and very, very, very similar and everybody's flow, or I guess you can say the rapping style is very similar. And, and, you know, I just wanted to say that when you are hip hop, you're a culture of things. You're not just rap and you're not just music, but you're more than just, you know, what you are over the beat. It's more than just a beat and a cool hook and a, and a sound, and, you know, because we need to get back to that idea of listening to what we're saying because we're very influential at the same time. So I think that was kind of where I was going once it all wrapped up. I don't think I started that way, but, but it ended up kind of that way. So. <laughs> it delivers for sure. Uh, it's a great song. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, when he when he said it to me the, the first time, I got chills, and it's sort of this notion that what happens to one of us affects all all, all of us, right? And the punchline that I'm, you know, he's describing something, right? And I'm like, who who who's he describing? And at the end, he's like, I'm hip hop, and I'm like, man, okay, this is this is he's really got something here. You know, the opening line is, um, I'm Michael Brown, Trayvon, and Emmett Till. And uh, I don't know, song's maybe four years ago, you wrote it. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, n not that that subsided, but that that you know, um, people dying at the hands of police or dying at the hands of being falsely accused of things, uh, was certainly in the forefront of uh, politics and the social landscape when he wrote that song. And so it's like, I mean, that's one line, you know. I'm Michael Brown, Trayvon, and Emmett Till. I am the splitting image of soul saved and killed. And it's like I got chills instantly. And I was like, okay. Keep going. I, I, you know, no cards. Keep going. You know, and so we did. Re, we re-recorded re that one a, a few times yeah. to get it to where, to where we wanted it. But that was so. Again, it's kind of non-conventional. Not worrying about hooks. Not worrying about commercial radio arrangements. Not caring whether somebody's going to play it or not. We made that for us, yeah. and and we hope that that other people like it. An interesting thing I kind of thought about was you made the beat and you wrote to it. You wrote the song, but really you inspired the writing to that song, right? Well, I think what you're saying is the you, you react to the mood of the song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do a song after the break called Love is Love, where I had a very <laughs> specific, I wrote a book, I had a very specific <laughs> idea of how many people were gonna die on that song, and then he, he did something else with it. We'll tell that story. The, the radio I showed, the, you know, I think, uh, what, here, here's maybe a good closing comment or segue for you, Christian, is that, is that, you know, when you talk to people about rock, that people go, oh, well, there's heavy metal, there's speed metal, there's punk, there's classic rock. Like, people really understand there's all these genres of rock. We feel the same way about hip hop, right? There's, there's all these different styles of hip hop. And so, when I think about, like, the rock show, what I do, that's kind of like, if, if we're talking movies, it's like action. That, it's, that would be the best way to describe it. It's like Scarface and, you know, it's like car chases and, and, it, and it'd be the action, you know, genre. <laughs> and, 
and 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 so that's where I tend to default when I'm making music. I'm like, what's what's getting me like rah? You know, like I, and so then I give it to him. I'm like, you gotta be like rah. And he's like, I don't have to be like rah. You know, all the time. I can be what I want to be. I'm like, dang, okay. So um, well, and then when you think about that beat too, which is where the I got emotional with it. I mean, when you just listen to the instrumental by itself. It is very boom bap and very headbanging, and like, and you could totally spit a lot of. Look. I'm you could totally about be, all your albums are all straight boom. Yeah, boom bap. Uh, I mean, I could and I could totally get braggadocious over that, which I, so I don't know if I was in that, but it, it didn't give me that over it. I just wanted to talk, and kind of, and it came out to be what it what it is, you know. So right, when you're talking like boom bap styles, like '90s, yeah, East Coast, 90s yeah, yeah, well. I like to say East Coast because that's what I like most. But you know, I don't. I, don't, I mean, there are people on the West Coast who do the same. I mean, we're both on the West Coast yeah. and we love that style. But um, you know, so yeah, I would say the generation of hip hop was East Coast music and, and sampling, uh, you know, bass kicks and stuff and beats like that. So kind of yeah. from the early, well, late '80s, early '90s, early and then '90s. Uh, yeah, we could talk about the golden age and see, I guess, <laughs> you know, what that means and saying that. But also just, yeah, some of them, um, I'd like to hear, not at this moment, but when we get back, like Chad's take on their collaborative process and sort of, um, I don't know, some of the things they do beyond the puppets and um, how he lied to his parents about his major for a couple of years. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I didn't think that. <laughs> just, like, kept it. Out of the yeah, same time. Yeah. You know, got to do this cool theater stuff. But, um, but yeah, we have um, some food and drink out there. Wayne's happy to, you know, sort of talk about stuff the station's doing. There's, there's Wendy and others around here. And if you want to buy, are there raffle tickets for sale for the Practice New Year's Eve so. event? Yeah, So, right where you can win and watch a car and just go have fun and whatnot. Also, up at the Gem Center this year, right? So. Mm -hmm. Deborah can tell you about that, but um, that was a good first half. Thanks, guys. So much. Yeah, feel free to chat with us on the break. We're happy to answer any questions or talk about anything. Thank you. Thank you. to our time as possible, but um, yeah, we're back. And um, I guess I want to introduce a, a new aspect, a new wrinkle we're throwing in there this evening is we have like, marionette puppets. We're not going to do them right now, but at the end of the night, they're going to be dancing with the help of <laughs> one or two of you up here to your final song. I do want to hear about the dance off that was the, the, the challenge the thrown down <laughs> at the uh, absence camp, I believe it was. Oh, that was that was me. Yeah, that was you. With customary. Oh. Yeah, we got hired to play a church. There's this mega church out in Napa. I can't remember the name of it, but they had this youth camp, and we got hired to do a hip hop show. And the theme of the camp, we didn't know until we got there, was abstinence. And, and, and there was all these chaperones that had, like, it was like privacy police, or it had some slogan on it. Arms length apart. And, and we were, uh, it was, it was, we got in the car at the end of the night, and we looked at it, and we go, what the hell happened? I go, I don't know. But it was like a really good paying job. So it was, it was definitely a take the money and run. Hopefully it doesn't show up on the internet. You know. so, yeah. But at some point, 11... Oh, they, they was challenged to a, a, a dance or maybe a, no, it was, it was actually it was a, customary, yeah. and this little girl challenged them to an ice ice baby oh wrap God. off, and th that I do have on video. If we were <laughs> <laughs> we were need black male black male customary. I do have. Uh, yes. oh, and she's no. in his face, and she's like rolling in my 5.0, just like, <laughs> <laughs> all the hands and you know that. And, yeah. and I'm like that song like Did predates you by like 30 years. He was this. Like, take, taking, you know, the hands were like that, and he was like, you know, just taking yeah, shots. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so. That's a different story, but we will have that kind of thing happen with Marionette Puppets <laughs> later on. Yes. But let's roll into 
Love is love. Yeah, so a quick uh, preview on that. If you've ever been to an Ian Jay show, you've heard that you've heard the preview. But um, you know, <coughs> again, sending uh, eleven music. This was one where I actually kind of pitched a hook, and and I remember there's a point in the song where the bass kind of <coughs> drops down. And, and I kind of wanted the song to be about me. <laughs> and I kind of wanted the song to be about my beats. And so it was kind of like, you know, Jason D's beats, da 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 da, or something. And I kind of had this sing songy thing. But the rest of it, I was like, man, you, you got to really go for it. So he's like, uh, he's like, you know, um, I'm ready to record to it. So. I don't even think I, you were like, oh, let me hear it or something. You didn't, like, no. you didn't. You were like, do you want to practice? Because usually when, you know, I'll come over to Jason's house after my family sleep, his family sleep, and we go to work, you know. But he, he usually gives me some time to practice. He'll put on the beat. And I was like, no, I'm ready. We'll just go. So he hadn't even heard it. And I just kind of went in and, and went after it. And he was just like, what? You know, so and when, if you hear the original song at the beginning, the beat comes on and, and Jason's like, are you okay? You know, I mean, do you, you, you need a hug? You know, is everything all right? Kind of thing. So, I mean, that's kind of, are you looking for it? Yeah, I was trying to see it? if I had the, the <clears throat> and, album. And I'm just giggling and laughing because, we actually went into the booth together to do it, like we were going to banter back and forth. And, and I didn't know what he was going to say, so when he said that to me, I just busted out laughing. So I didn't even get any like words out to say back to him, and he's just like, L O Cool J, rappers need love, you know? <laughs> and I'm just cracking up, and then finally I'm like, no, you know, and I tell my, my reason for writing the song. So, but uh, yeah, the beat was very, again, boom bap, and you know, typical Jason D, and, and I was like, oh, I just want to, I want to talk about my wife a little bit, you know, or love, you know, so, yeah, yeah. but. So, I, <laughs> so one other, so I couldn't find the, the original on, on short notice, but be sure to listen to it. You, you actually hear our banter that was totally unscripted and yeah. unprompted about, I'm like, what do you mean you want to make a love song? And, like, <laughs> and then I'm like, LL Cool J? I'm like, rappers need hugs? Because like, we're in this closet, like right? This and I'm like, like, do you need a hug? Like, I'm really like, like, giving them crap like I, like I do through the process. So. Um, one thing about the song is we performed it so much that um, I wanted to um, change it up. So we're going to play a version that has a, has a beat change up halfway through. And the beat I mix in is Big Daddy Kane, uh, Smooth Operator, which is, which is kind of like um, his version is like, you know, I, I uh, you know, appreciate and love my wife. And, and the Big Daddy Kane song is like, yo, I'm this bad player. So it's kind of the juxtaposition of that. It's kind of subtle. Most people wouldn't know it. But the other thing about it is there wasn't an instrumental of that song. They used to make these these uh, versions on records back in the day, and they called them TV tracks. So it had all the ad libs. So it's riddled with his vocals. So I literally had to reconstruct the song. So in other words, I had to per chop it up into all these different pieces and then replay it to make it sound like the instrumental. So you also kind of make this unless you did what I did. So it's sort of, it's one of those things people in the audience would never know, but I went to really great lengths That's just to be able to <laughs> mix in this one little, this one little thing. So let's, let's run it for him. This is Love is Love. You want to say your parts? Say your parts. <laughs> you okay? You need a hug? I'm good, I'm good. Hello, <laughs> good <laughs> That's literally what it is. We laugh and we laugh. When I'm alone in my room, my hand, my car just got <laughs> Say, you know, you act like I'm not in love or I haven't been in love before, everybody's been in love. They talk about love. Yo, it's never really overnight that you find a good thing. It takes time. Soon you find divinity. A quality obtained through equality, not by majority. Love it means more to me now. Guessing with age, you understand fate. That day you meet your mate, you better have faith to keep it strong for years with all the fights and tears. Stay committed like a life career. It's all love. Man, it ain't never all good. They say disagreements are healthy. You should have arguments and struggle a bit. But never let it get to the point where you're raising your fists. I've been there. And if I can take back that day I pushed you, I would have pulled you close and kissed you. I never foresaw this picture. You and I were kids. I like the most high with scripture. Most guys don't realize the life they need is not always the one you want. Time to run can be progress toward the world you hunt. So you prevent the plot like a hawk to top. Which means you're sitting on the spot to protect your heart. Not the one beating for you, but the one you got. There are two types of pain in this world you go through. Regret or discipline. Which one is for you? Come on. Love is love. That's understood. If you trust and respect me, you should. If you want to connect, baby, we could. But only if you love me. Let's go. Love is love. Let's make it good. If you want and you need me, you should. We'll be on top of the world. Yeah, we could. But only if you love me. Love. Uh, you better have some.
your seek hope Two of you should move in unison towards growth Cause every day is a present So open it with the future in mind That whatever you find You leave the past behind Focus on what you gain Not what you lose or loss On what you give Not what you bought My box to the left That is I want to toss And everything that's left We split at all costs Nothing works unless it's 100% From fights to paying bills For real it's no joke The effort is all work You gotta love it Or the play won't be worth it I'm not talking perfect relationships They don't exist in public You always coexist Behind closed doors You let each other know how much you miss And you'll be singing the tune Sort of like this You might even grow old together Become grandparents Watch your families mold together Be the not to help your family hold together Don't let nothing come between you Man, I've seen the worst first hands Like degree of separation Could be cities and states Between your foundation But it starts with you The support you give to be the best to help your partner live uh, Love is love, that's understood If you trust and respect me, you should If you want to connect, babe, we could But only if you love me Let's go, love is love, let's make it good If you want and you need me, you should We'll be on top of the world, yeah, we could But only if you love me So um, I got distracted by the one thing, but uh, there's an Easter egg in this song. So sometimes um, Easter egg is a commonly referred to term that like software developers make where they hide something inside of the program for you to find and find later. And so every now and then in our creative process, we'll do something that's like funny to us or meaningful to us, and I'm curious if, if you do similar. So this particular song, I was, I was shocked that he made a love song out of it, we established that. But as I sat there and, and listened to it over and over and then decided I need to go lay down some scratches, you know, I was talking about the, the original rule in hip-hop is no biting, so you don't copy, but it is very customary to pay homage to things that have come before you respect mm -hmm. it. And so Houdini had this great song, I think in the late 80s, and it's called One Love, and they're talking about different relationships, friendships, personal relationships, and the guy's saying, you're lucky just to have just, just one. And so to me, that was the perfect scratch to end this song. But if you think about what, what Eleven's doing through that song, he's professing how great his wife is and how great his family is. Well, I thought he's a good guy too. So my scratch is, you're lucky just to have just one, but then I make it say, one, one. What's one, one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so let me play it for you one more time and, and, and you'll, you'll, you'll be able to hear it. <laughs> Jokes, you know, something that, that means more to you guys. Oh, I Hermuta, yeah, Hermuta is a, oh, a character yeah. that uh, hosts hosts the, the the puppet affair, the horrific puppet affair, and uh, something we like to do with that character, uh, we give him his job primarily is to host the play, but but we used to in our first few years write little plays that explain like a backstory or expand his origin stories or whatever. And then as we grew, uh, we decided to start handing that character and that task to playwrights to just have whatever they want to do with him. Uh, and uh, we've had some really interesting and fun pieces come out of that. Heidi's uh, written one. And um, uh, yeah, we've, uh, yeah, that's something we've done. Um, yeah, I don't know. So, so 
herself referential stuff, you know, within, yes, you know, totally, totally. You know, a bit of an in joke or a yeah. little bit of like a nod, Shakespearean style, you know, yeah. a bit of this, yeah, yeah. yes, a touch, <laughs> but um, I don't know, just like maybe back to, I don't know, your own personal origin story um, as a playwright, an actor, going back to that hiding it from, like, sure, like, it's sure. like the shame, I, I yeah. definitely can relate to that back yeah. in the day when like, oh, you want to be a writer? I don't think that maybe advertising, or, yeah. you know, sort of PR work would be good for you. But how was that? I mean, and you can answer a little bit for Jamie because it is kind of the way you both have come from small communities, mm -hmm. you know, sort of in Idaho, and then chosen to stay in Boise after some great success. I mean, you could take it to a bigger city, but I'm curious what, I don't know, your role, what your view of your role in Boise is after coming from small towns and whatnot. Yeah. Ooh, that's a lot wow. of questions. That's right. a, yeah. Um, I mean, there was like seven questions in there. There was. <laughs> so, so, coming here is from a small city. Sure. Uh, yeah, I I grew, uh, Jamie grew up in Filer, Idaho, uh, and there was like, there's no theater program where she grew up, uh, and so she uh, drove to Buell. To, to do theater, uh, the, yeah, the theater capital of Eastern Idaho, uh, uh, and I grew up in Star before it, you know, it was, it was it's you know, still small, but it was a lot smaller, um, and, and uh, yeah, there, you know, we we went to Boise State for for school, and and I, I think it was it was that in which we fell in love with with the city of Boise, and. Um, it, w it was a, a little bit this experience that we would have. I, I remember us having uh, about the point where we were 2021 20, or something, where we would go see a lot of plays locally, and then also, um, you know, in, in bigger cities. And we were always uh, the youngest people there, and and by by generations, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, and and we would. Also, then go home and and or we'd go like the Nurlux or whatever. We'd go out to a bar and we'd see all these people who were our uh, age and people who were like us, and we'd talk to them. They're like, "Hey, why don't you go to plays?" And and uh, you know all the reasons were you know, th well they don't make plays for me, or it's too expensive, or I I don't I don't you know I don't want to take the the risk or, or something of, of spending my evening like that. Um, and so, so for for us and, and our decision to stay in Boise is, is we wanted we wanted to create a theatrical experience that wasn't unlike going to see uh, some you know some music at, at the Neurolux or we, we, we wanted to um, kind of make something that was for you know people like us young people and, and uh, tells the stories of uh, young folks and and help them find a. A community, you know. Um, I was just talking to you a little bit, uh, or I was talking to you a little bit about how uh, a really cool thing happens. We're at, at our shows sometimes where people come alone and they haven't been to a play in, you know, five plus years, if ever, and uh, and they don't think they're going to like it or whatever. And then suddenly they find themselves in a room of people very like-minded to them, and and I, and I <laughs> love tracking people who I know uh, did not know each other before they started seeing our plays, who are now coming to our plays as groups. Uh, so, so um, uh, that for sure, yeah, it's, and about. <laughs> a little bit of a reference, no, but, but that's the mission of your, you know, sort of the theater, the homegrown folks. Um, and also, you talked about we spoke earlier about kind of like price point too, as yeah. far as like ticketing and all that kind of stuff. And like, it can be prohibitive. It is. Yeah, it so. is. When when the cost of something is thirty five dollars and you don't know if it's going to be good, mm, well, that's really that's a huge risk to spend thirty five dollars in two hours of, of, you know, people who make as much money as I do in a year. Um, that's a that's a huge financial risk. Um, and uh, so, you know, that's how much it's worth, and that's how much it's uh, how much it costs, and we let folks know. If you can afford how much it costs, please spend what what it costs. But if you can't, don't you know? Don't stay home. Um, you know, we we offer tickets for twenty dollars a ticket and ten dollars a ticket because because you know it's it's 
we believe that art should be like absolutely accessible uh, that it doesn't and, and you know people all the time like don't have ten dollars and they email us and they're like what can I do and we're like well just mm -hmm. come figure it out or whatever you know uh, we, we, we don't think that like economics should be a barrier to uh, watching a play and and, and it's 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 our it's our you know long term goal. We we've got like a membership program set up, but if if we can get the membership program, I was chatting with you a little bit about this. If we can get that membership program to like uh, a high enough number, we want to do uh, like zero cost tickets. We'll just yeah. be show up and, or yeah. book ahead of time and show up and don't pay anything. Right. That's yeah. That's it's such a difficult thing to you know do what you do. And be able to pay your own bills and like really bring a like sort of an important you know sort of um, I don't know artistic entity to the community um, and I guess for both of you I mean I guess for you first Chad I guess um, I don't know what what do you think the overall role like of I don't know theater and what you do at Homegrown like what what are your like community goals here like what do you really want to do. I, I, if we can, uh, if if we can help people come together and feel, you know, express experiences that we've had and that other people may feel alone on or something like that, if if we can help, you know, create community that way, uh, then I, I think that's what our role is. And what do you think that your most successful <clears throat> like productions have been with that? I mean, that might be a typical typical question to answer, but I'm sure you have. Sure. Heard in all of it, but yeah, we, they some of your most. You know. We, we uh, I, <laughs> I think in the last like two two years, some uh, two of our most successful plays that we've done. We did this play uh, called She Kills Monsters recently, um, which was about these sisters who uh, who didn't really necessarily have an eye to eye relationship, and uh, it's it's um, um, you know. It's only after one of the characters has has died that they're able to to come together, and you know the the surviving sister is able to see uh, the deceased sister, and um, you know there's a uh, uh, that that play ended up you know the the thing that the sister wasn't able to see, the older sister wasn't able to see uh, w was how am I trying to word I don't know blah blah blah. Um, you know, I, I think that there was there was a lot of uh, queer themes in that play, and and themes about like suicide, and uh, and and I think that folks who have felt, um, you know, like their family doesn't understand them and doesn't hear them, uh, I think that meant a lot to a lot of folks. That was at least expressed to us anyway. Um, and we had another play uh, the previous year, Sing to Me Now, um, um, again about sisters. Um, uh, which uh, I won't talk as much about that one, but but yeah, it it, it when when yeah. Anyway. So you felt like those two in particular sort of right now stuck out <clears throat> to you at least as you know connecting with uh, your overall mission. Yeah, your, and if it can help, know. if it can help, like I said, if it can help people feel less like alone in their experiences, then that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about you guys? As far as <clears throat> you know, what you bring. To the artistic, you know, sort of like community and hip hop community, or just you know this community radio station. Like what? I looked at myself. I'll, I'll go first. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Any surprises there? Yeah. Uh, and what do you want? To do? Well, you know, it's actually a couple of things that Chad talked about resonated with me. You know, one is this this um, concept of the H divide, right? And so, you know. Um, uh, people consider us, there's like slang terms, but they call us old heads, right? So like, we're old hip hop heads, and the style of music we do is like old head stuff. So there's something strange in hip hop where there's this really big, for me personally, there's this big divide between older folks and, and, and younger folks, and to the point where the older folks are very dismissive of what the kids are, the kids are doing. I was quite guilty of that in the last hour, talking about trap rap and commercial radio. <laughs> but um, the, then at the same time, the younger kids, they just don't, um, it's like they they look at us as old and, and, and like out, outdated. Um, and so what's interesting is that when you, you know, hip hop is so deeply rooted in street culture, and when you look at street culture, uh, the old heads are called OGs, and the OGs are supposed to teach the, the young, the, ba the, you know, the babies, the baby gangsters or whatever. 
And so that's a big part of like street culture, but somehow it doesn't carry over to music. Like there's this divide. And I feel like, you know, you look at a, at a genre like country and young artists are doing songs with older artists all the time, and, and, or they're redoing songs that older artists did and paying tribute to them. And there's something, there's some gap there. So, you know, I feel like um, our role, at least in a local local way, is to try and help bridge that gap, you know? And so, you know, a lot of what I do on the, with the radio shows, you know, there's younger people coming to me and they're like, I've got this music, but I don't know how to get anyone to play it or hear it or whatever. So I, I spent a lot of time talking uh, to, to younger folks about their, their music and then trying to get people to appreciate, you know, kind of what came before them. And so a lot of times my show, I'm explaining why this old record is so meaningful and what the context of it was and what the style was and, you know, why, why, why it was the way it was. What, what would be your take on that? I agree. I mean, for me, I look at the writing process, and I was speaking with your friend, what was your name? Jodine. Jodine. Jodine, about, you know, how, I mean, I used to do music without a care, just, it was just about the music and trying to fit in and be tough, and, and as I got older, I realized, wait, you know, I, I have a responsibility, you know, I mean, I have a responsibility for my words, for who I am as a person, and, and so therefore, what I say, if someone goes and follows what I say or do or whatever, that was, I got to take, I mean, not saying that they should, but I love being able to make music that my kids can listen to or I can play in the car and I'm not worried about it or like my students or whatever. But then at the same time when I go to a show, I try to speak to the kids. If there's kids in the audience, like I'll walk up to them and, and rap in their face and high fire or whatever because I want them to like this genre of music. I want them to go, oh, the, the hip hop is good. Or, you know, and their parents to go the same thing. Oh, my kid can listen to music. So, and I felt like that's how I was growing up. I mean, the music that we listened to, I wasn't afraid to play it around my parents. I wasn't afraid. Well, when NWA came out, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, <laughs> um, but actually, uh, but you know, I mean, so a lot of them. Um, I would say ninety to ninety-five percent of what I listened to, I played it openly. I wasn't afraid to hide it from my folks. And and so today, though, I listen to music on the radio, and it's something that comes out, and I'm just like, oh no, no, no. Well, now let's stop singing that song, you know, and, yeah. and so I feel myself doing that. So um, I feel just as a responsibility to connect and bridge that gap with kids with hip hop and, and let them kind of see what good hip hop is. Um, you know. Yeah, and maybe quickly before you guys go into another song and a little, little bit of uh, marionette training, you can go to the final <laughs> song. Okay. <Yeah. laughs> but as, a, as an English teacher, um, I don't know, do you bring hip hop into the classroom at all. I mean obviously the, I mean you you said you're not currently exactly teaching. Yeah, I just stepped like, down from teaching English but, but um, you've been doing it for twenty so years. Twenty, 20 years. years yeah. So yeah. I mean you, you know, you're I am a, uh, a pentameter here. <laughs> you know, sort of different you know, Yeah. You know, your sonnets or villanelles, you know, yeah. the poetry of all that stuff. But um have you used much of maybe your own work? or others you admire? Oh yeah, of course. Um, you know, here, I mean, when I lived in San Diego, I used to do an African-American poetry unit all the time and brought in Tupac poetry and, and would, would analyze Tupac's lyrics and other lyrics of songs that I liked. Um, I've done it a few times here. Poetry were probably my favorite unit because it is a breaking down of, of the words. And um, what I would have the students do is, is come into the classroom with song lyrics. I would make them go home and that was their homework to come back with song lyrics. Didn't matter what, if it was hip hop or rock or whatever, they just bring song lyrics in. And then we'd analyze the lyrics as poetry and figure out what's the message and the theme and how they're getting that across and what's the beat pattern and I mean the rhyme pattern and all that stuff. Um, but I did use uh, our song I Am in my classroom before because I wanted my students to actually write a rap about themselves and, and what made them who they, they are. So I actually brought in the lyrics to I Am, the song that we did earlier on Michael Brown, Trayvon. And I did that in front of my kids and, and, um, and then I made them mimic it and write a, write a, a poem very similar. And the response was awesome. And some of the kids who I thought you know, I, I was interested to see what they would write, and they got up and kind of blew my socks off just by expressing who they were through that that form of, of poetry, you know. And um, and I even had a mom come to me and say, "Oh, my daughter was practicing that for days, you know, because <laughs> she knew she had to recite it in class." And I was like, "That's awesome." But you know, to me, when you strip the beat away, I mean, it's funny. Jason, Jason's a 
you know, a pretty creative guy. I mean, he does all our beats, but, you know, we have our albums on all streaming platforms, but he also puts the instrumentals up and, and he'll, he uh, takes me out of the picture, which is cool, I guess. And about about that. That. <laughs> so, yeah. so, you know, and it's just him because it's just a beat. You know, um, and I jokingly said, "Oh, you should put up the acapellas then, and and take y yourself out." But but not you know not that not not that I need that. But when you <laughs> but when you take when you strip beat away from music, it becomes poetry. You know, and and because you can read it however you want to read it. You know, you don't have to read it to any beat or pattern. And you mentioned Shakespeare earlier, and and I, and I love sonnets, and I and I do a sonnet unit, I don't know anymore, but I used to do a sonnet unit and teach kids I am the contemporary and how they're supposed to flow through the beat and then we, that's how we got into rap and stuff, but yeah, and I think kids like it, you know, because rap music or hip hop is like, oh, we don't talk about it, you know, and can't play it, and I'm like, no, we can play this, and here's an edited version. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the students at Boise State have to take, oh, a, yeah, have have to take an ethics class, and one of the yeah. Yeah, ethics options is... Um, uh, it's around music, and, yeah. and um, we've been guest lecturers in that three, four times. Three times. Yeah. 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 yeah, so we've gone in and you know talked to students about, and that's really fun because then you can really have those young versus old, you know, uh, conversations with people who are like in a class and talking about social responsibility lyrics and things yeah. like that. It's really, yeah, it's pretty yeah interesting. absolutely. And this, I mean, historical social narratives. Yeah. You know that. Yeah, I will admit that I was. Mowing my parents' lawn, <laughs> listening to Grandmaster Flash. <laughs> yeah. I was like 15 and we're like in suburbia, and it did change my life in a lot of ways. I, I won't get my own story, but it was like really educational. Yeah. I mean, what, you know, that was just, uh, I don't know, hip hop has bridged a gap, and we don't get into all that. We could probably talk for a few more hours on that. But, you know, sort of. Uh, I agree. What y'all are doing is fantastic, and um, bring us another song. Yeah. So uh, just planning accordingly, it looks like we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, we have one song or two songs left. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, two songs. We have a little marionette training. We started. Okay. Let's just start that because it's okay. You spoke earlier about the the third album coming out. This is yeah. a, this is the first song that we did, which actually created the title of the song. Because I think I I thought of a line. Um, from Nas, or I think it was Nas, there ain't a longer that can strike back, and uh, that's what I wanted him to put on the song, and then he didn't do what I asked, so I guess it's kind of, a, but, um, so we, but we came up with the title track and the album title off that. Yeah, I think I'll highlight the chorus, um, it's, it's, uh, there's a, there's an, uh, an old head, a fellow old head, his name is Ed O.G., he's from Boston, and he had this, this song where he had this line that really stood out to me, and he says, that they say you, um, uh, they say you do that old-ish up, update. So that's like the kids talking to him. You, you do that old stuff, man. Update. And he says, I say you do that old-ish upgrade. So he's like, <laughs> you know, coming back. And so that's the hook. It's like we're sort of saying we're here, we're back, we're not changing, we're not gonna, we're not gonna change our formula because this is this is what we are. So. Stage <laughs> I take a burden like my dog was killed in this room, but you gotta be the 
murderer. I'm at your porch knocking on your door religiously. Put out a Bible scripture, just the words of your history. Payback before you even take a breath of misery. Rebel without a pause, took the flavor at your infantry. The EP release was heat, no hesitating, but we back at it again. No, this the separation, the ensemble. You can never match the combo. Connected, I'll measure your ruler and head hunter. The intuition to stay in line with the mission. We bring it to your submission, torn feather competition with the elements. These beats stomp like elephants, you know the ledge. I got the juice, watch it settle in. I put in time over time to be the greatest. My rhyme gets better with time, you won't play it. So, say what you want, I'm on the road just to take it. The base, you start moving like you fit to me. Award shows for best MC right here on stage with a mic. How you found it is not clear. How your ballot come about without checking cats' careers. Your reach on social media is weak, so it appears. If you don't know who's hot in the game, that you ask and rappers themselves to hope for themselves is so lame. It's more than rap, you need that. Respect it for the boom that. Raise the culture, you do that. Hit the line like a bull that. Just to carry tradition to the zone. Again. Leave it at that. I'm like a battle axe with a pin. Come on. I put in time over time to be the greatest. My rhyme gets better with time. You overrated. They so say what you want. I'm on the road just to take it. They Well, we have this process of trying to get albums out before Tree Fort um, and, and kind of release them at Tree Fort. At least that's what yeah. we did with the first two. And then the last Tree Fort, we were, I mean, the creative process and stuff was kind of, I was taking too long. Um, so we're trying <laughs> we're trying to get this next one out before Tree Fort again so we can release it like so we've been like doing. February, March. February, March, March yeah. 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 Um, all our stuff is on all streaming platforms. I think they're, yeah, it's just 11 and Jason D. And, um, to your point, we also thought our music should be accessible to anyone, so it's available for free download mm -hmm. off Bandcamp. Mm -hmm. So, we just, yeah. same kind of thing. We Instrumental more versions more. too, without me. And I guess you have, you have these puppets, but also sort of, I don't know, like, let's talk a little bit before, you know, you like full puppet dance mode. Yeah. Which is, I mean, what you have going with the. Uh, Perfect Puppet Affair coming up and like I don't know it runs like three weeks runs both days weeks. yeah how to get tickets and also just you have one more show for the year like Lung I think it was Lung yeah, yeah we're Lung proposing the, the season <laughs> release play called Lungs after the Puppet Affair uh, which is this wild play it's a uh, these this a uh, uh, young couple uh, having a conversation that spans their life about whether it's uh, a responsible decision to have a child. And uh, it's it's a really beautiful script, and um, uh, we'll, that'll anyway. That opens like in December. December that'll run December through so, January. Um, so come check that out after you check out the puppet affair. The puppets. Of, you only do puppets during that part of the year. This uh, perfect puppet affair. Yeah, so that's our that's our main. Occasionally, puppets sneak into the rest of the productions because we like. Yes. You like it? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, the, the, so the Puppet Affair uh, this year is, um, is about ghost stories. Uh, uh, we have a full lineup of ghost stories and kind of all the different forms that ghosts may take, whether they be something that, you know, hides in your whatever closet or that's out to get you, uh, or, or it's, maybe it's a memory that's been coming back and um, haunting you, you know, your regret or your something. So we kind of are exploring like why we as humans are afraid of ghosts and, and why uh, we continue to tell those, those stories. Um, so come check that out. Uh, we do have a guest writer every year and uh, our guest writer this year is, is Christian Wynn. So, uh, so uh, 
uh, he hasn't seen any of his of uh, what we've done. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
for me. He didn't even know that. And later you'll hear undering of a pressure, like, sneaking in there. But that was kind of like, as, as coming into my own as somebody who was making music, that was kind of my middle finger to everybody that had said yeah. in their lives. So I'm like, okay, I'll take that. <laughs> I'll throw it back at you with something that I think is even, even better. And I just want to add, um, first I want to say thank you for everyone being here. This has been awesome. New experience. Thanks for having us. Uh, and just, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I want to acknowledge the other MCs in here and, and supporters. I mean, we have Holistic Meditation in here, Axiom the Wise. I mean, Dave the Fave, he goes by 20 different names. I'll just say with Dave. Um, I mean, from Dedicated Service. And uh, uh, Dougie Fresh is here with, I mean, I keep staring at this shirt he has on. That's actually my signature from uh, my first album that I, you, you mentioned with Noah. So that kind of throws me back. But, I mean, I, when I moved here looking to do hip-hop, you know, I mean, I was, I was accepted into the community and, and you know, did did a song with you. I mean, we've done many songs, and he asked me to open for him or do a show for them over at the Nolux one. So I just appreciate all the love and respect that that I've gotten, and and I hope I show that back to you guys and throw that back to you guys too, because we are a community, and as much as we try to outdo each other or whatever, like I support you guys, and and I mean, you make me better. I think I mentioned that in our finest and in the finest track. I talk about how. You know, we make each other better and push each other to be good MCs and good musicians. So, you know, and then this song actually, I think it was the first one because the story that I wrote is about how I got booed and hushed and booed and I was a minute on cruise. You know, no review though because there was a, a review that the Boise Weekly did about me at that Red Room show and they just kind of ripped me apart. So I was like, <laughs> so, so that that's kind of in this song. So this is our starting like this opened up for us. But. So, public service is so good. Bringing it back. What's his name? Why are we naming this? So, I'll just stay over here so you guys can see it. Scarecrow. Scarecrow. Sure. Let's go. All right. Here we go. You guys ready? <laughs> so. Yeah. And one of my first influential hip hop hip hoppers were E T M B and Jason Judas and that too. So. Oh, oh. Go, go, Scarecrow. Go, Scarecrow. Get it, get it. 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 Get no chance, look, I'm waiting for the big dance. Clap your hands together, inhale, fill your lungs and your eardrums with a vibe guaranteed to hit you. I've been shunned and shooed, hushed and booed. A minute on cruise, in control, no review is gonna stop me now. My story still shines, still be the star pissing through your shallow cloud. I'm moving the crowd, I know most y'all wonder. Techniques you sweat in the trance got you under. Follow the leader, never try, always prevail, derail anyone lesser. A comeback, no pressure. Holler tips for minds, I swear. Some of you fools will just backfire while I. Inspire the rules, desire the wire, connect or cordless, whatever fortress. I spit it clear, need a code for more risk. Oh, oh, oh. So eyes I behold, you watching my step, my moves, so you can copy the crew. I bring through, this is dope, on the ethic I work hard, you never have a fan pick like this, on your Christmas card, I doubt you even touch hands, my pounds be major, I buy from the savior, nothing else can save you, you're barking, sucking up your body, still standing, your image your last when you thought about the paper, killing them, no competition, this and the fact there's a protract, the point you are, lines don't connect to the numbers you treasure, or situations you build in your, I burn the night oil, not a plan for inspiration, the only J I know got five on rotation, Consolidation, most movable population. I'm in the mirror trying to surpass my reflection. Alright, we're gonna bring, bring the funk back. You ready? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna drop it. Make you guys work a little harder. Okay. Who rocks the spot? Who rocks the spot? Okay. Okay, here you guys go. Oh, he's gonna have to drop it. He's gonna have to drop it low on him. 
I make magic happen when rapping. Pull the rabbit out the pit. Funk like I just hands up if you are really gifted. Unlimited rhymes universal. Born during the birth, live while it was fertile. So much competition, the division wasn't equal. Some wanted money, some did it for the people. I never strayed my vision. I moved like a ghost through walls under the surface. I'm the most involved. Carry a color for the hopes to y'all. Street dreaming to realizing my life worth was y'all. Fell in love with the stage, writing words to a page, spitting verbs for the ages. Crowd, crowd, courageous. One said to be outrageous. Now known to be contagious. I went from ashy to almost famous. I went from catchy to no replacements. Cats running in circles, trying to be with Jason. I'll crush him off the shoulder, holster, fold the steel. A palm left to right in sight. Skills keep the mic tight. Device on sight for thrills. Anybody want to burst, make a deal or no deal. When I'm on the scene, I always rock the spot. That's the way it's out, man. Yeah, yeah, it's dead. It's done. Definitely the highlight of my week. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Those get crows. Those get crows. Those get we should have. It would have been great to have the lady and the guy at the same time. Oh, <laughs> I know. We didn't really, you know, this is just like Chad said, it's the first time he's ever done this. Oh, what do you use? What do you use? He's going to be part of the Hunter 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 this year. These characters, none of these characters are part of this year's uh, show. Um, uh, I don't know when you can see them next. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Uh, uh, maybe we'll do a video eventually and have one of those. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we have a little bit more hip hop planned later in the season for Couch Surfer. Well, but the second Sunday of the month, we'll have um, some uh, military veterans who have this uh, consortium of, of musicians, uh, Operation um, Encore, and also um, a great writer in Cynthia Han, global, global novelist, short story writer um, for, for next month. But um, I think we have some exciting, fun stuff coming up for both of y'all. But, um, the album um, for Up and Fair. Um, and then all the stuff is like, Ray Voice is doing it too. This is so cool. Yeah. Does anybody have one final question for either or both of these fine, or all the three? I mean, I'm sorry that Jamie's not here. I'll say it. Because I didn't want to speak to some of you. You, know, you seem to have a very, I don't know, like, feminist forward sort of like. You know, sort of like programming and sort of angle, which is fantastic, but um, we'll get it next time and yeah. you know, on, that, on that Sunday. But questions? Yeah, one question. Best way to see upcoming shows on your website? Yeah, media. Uh, we're on social media, uh, Homegrown Theater. Um, we're on uh, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, or our website is hgtboise.org. And the Gem Center, do they sell tickets through the Gem Center? Uh, we, sell, we sell our tickets. Okay. And that is, but that's up on, where is the Gem Center? Uh, the Gem Center is on Vista, you know the Maytag uh, washing lady? We like to call her Boise's first puppet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's definitely not true. Uh, um, uh, bank drive. Uh, and bank, on bank drive, yeah. Okay, very nice. Um, you guys, upcoming shows, like, just yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, just working on an album. Yeah, hip hop's pretty fluid. You know, somebody will get booked, and then one of us will open for somebody, and you know, never. I could say I have nothing now, and then two weeks from now we'll have something. So it's just it's pretty fluid. But yeah, our focus. Uh, we have we have a long run of shows there, so now we get to get back. To re we were on rehearsal mode for a long time, so now we get to get back to recording. Mode. But, yeah, I just want to say thank you to everyone that came out. Yeah. We're gonna feel we're, we're gonna mill out and you know, mill around and talk to people or whatever. So you're gonna have to race that. Uh, oh, exactly. And if um if you recorded or took pictures or anything, I'd love to see them. If you could tag us, or I mean, I'm I'm Maxwell Eleven because it's like my music and family, so it's spelled out Maxwell Eleven and J DJ Jason D. 
Um, yeah, the man has been, uh, I mean, or hashtag it, allowed to just be, uh, we're gonna go that way too, but, yeah, on Instagram. Yeah, and Facebook too, right?